Hello, and uh, welcome to another edition of the uh, Tom and John Show. Um, where are we, John? How, what, how many are there? Like 22 or 23, something like that. I, I, keep, I don't keep track, but uh, we keep plugging along and uh, hope that you uh, who watch us, uh, whether it's uh, live or on YouTube or Google or whatever source you're using, um, I hope you're enjoying it. And, uh, Thanks for joining us again today. Um, today we have uh, the state of North Carolina well represented, and uh, they think they have a lot of stress down there on cool season grasses, and uh, so do we. Um, I've lived in State College for a long time, and I've never had a brown backyard for six weeks, and I turned up sprinklers on yesterday for the first time and what did we get a thunderstorm I'm gonna turn them on again <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much rain we got out of that thunderstorm but it dumped pretty good last night for a short period of time it probably all just washed off a surface runoff it's yeah. bon it's bon the surface, if the surface wasn't softened up by irrigation or something it probably didn't do much so I'll introduce uh, our guest Jim thanks for joining us um, Jim is uh, a, a longtime friend and a, a colleague, and we've kind of gone through the whole grad school. I think you were slightly behind me, Jim, in grad school, but grad school and then, um, you know, academia. And so, uh, Jim, I'll give you a brief introduction and let you kind of tell us more about how you got started in the industry um, from golf to, uh, you know, your bachelor's degree to Ph.D. to the work that you're doing now at NC State. But so you started out in Wheaton, Illinois. You grew up there, and then at some point you moved to uh, North Carolina. And then you got your mass or your bachelor's degree at NC State, your master's at Texas A&M, and then your PhD back with uh, Lane at NC State. Right? Were he, was he there the whole time, or did he leave um, before you finished? I think he was still there. Oh, right? There the whole time. Yeah. Um, and then you took a job uh, as an assistant professor at Wisconsin, and you were there about four and a half years. You said. And then decided, mm -hmm. okay, Lane left, uh, which left a void down in North Carolina, and. Um, I think <laughs> I think that when you um, before you even took that job, your department head or your dean or somebody had already announced that you were the new <laughs> turf pathologist at a major event um, at some event. Like, oh, that's news to me. That's a that's a hell of a bargaining power, I have to say. If they're already announcing you and you haven't signed a contract, that's pretty good. Um, but you've been there since 2012, and now you're an associate professor, which means you've gotten tenured. And uh, so kind of give me a, a 30,000 foot view of you know how you got to where you are now. Yeah, well, I guess uh, when we moved to North Carolina, it was my freshman year in high school and uh, the little town that we lived in, Sanford, North Carolina, I worked at a golf course called Quill Ridge. It was owned by two brothers, uh, Billy and Jimmy Parrish. Um, it was an interesting little combo because uh, Billy was more of the business side and his brother, Jimmy, was the ag side or agronomic side and I was hemming and hawing of what to do at NC State, was originally accepted in engineering, uh, went to orientation, and I was like, I oh, don't quite fit in, number one. Uh, I didn't think I was nearly smart enough to make it work. Uh, and he said, well, have you thought about agronomy? And I really enjoyed working with him, learning about the golf course, and kind of switched into that. Uh, really enjoyed it at NC State. Uh, and really the research side of things got picked up when I started working for Charles Peacock. Um, and that's when basically decided to go on to graduate school. Um, went to Texas A&M to work on a project that was actually not plant pathology related. It was uh, actually moving compost to dairy manure in sod and understanding the fate of phosphorus if you moved it out of one location into another. But took more plant path courses, and then this, as you know, superstar started forming at NC State. And uh, Dave Shue, uh, who is a good friend of mine, still in my department now, said, you really need to come work with this guy. Uh, and that's when I came back to work with Lane. And fortunately was there when Lane was building up the program, and got to see that firsthand and we worked on a I think a pretty fun disease that a lot of people still try to use to this day as a problem 
and we'll talk about that, I guess, in a, in a little bit. Um, and then um, the job at Wisconsin opened up, moved up there. It was fantastic. Actually, never thought I'd be back in North Carolina. I really enjoyed uh, superintendents in Wisconsin, uh, the faculty there, because I don't think any of us saw Lane moving uh, to the industry side of things. Um, but when it did, yeah, it was a nice little bargaining chip when uh, I was told afterwards that they were just targeting uh, me and Lee Miller, actually, were their choices to come back. And so it ended up working out. And it's been great ever since. Awesome. And I get to work with one of your former uh, staff members, Mike Soika, who many of you may know. He's absolutely phenomenal. Makes my job easy. <laughs> Funny, you said former, and I was thinking of Putman, and I was like, and I said knuckleheads, and then you mentioned Soika, and I'm like, no, 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 Soika's not in yeah. but Putman. Yeah. Well, I had Alex, too, for uh, six, six, seven months. Right. Um, you mentioned Lee Miller. I'll give a shout-out to him. I saw that he just got uh, his official tenure for associate professor. That's good for him. Um, Very so, good. Yeah, that's awesome. So you were um, in the, the stinkhole of um, growing grasses uh, between, I think, Maryland and D.C. and Philadelphia, and then obviously NC State, you know, North Carolina is a little different, too. Um, it's a pretty tough place to grow grass. So what I wanted to do, I've been traveling a bit, and you obviously are overseeing the NC State Diagnostic Lab. Um, I, what I wanted to do was talk to, to all three of us here um, about what we're seeing out in the field. And, and, Jim, I'll start with you, what you're seeing down there. Yeah, so I think you said it very well. Um, stinkhole is a nice way to, to put it. I think our dew points in North Carolina have been over 74 for the past five to six weeks every day. Um, so it's been pretty horrible. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I just heard that June, uh, across our area, I think even up to you guys, was the hottest. And at least for us, maybe the difference was it was the wettest um, for most of North Carolina. Uh, Charlotte has not. Charlotte has just been hot and dry uh, for North Carolina. but. As far as diseases, actually, um, I would say on the eastern seaboard, haven't seen as much as we thought. It's been a lot more just heat stress. Um, I hate this term, but people understand it really well. You know, wet wilt. Uh, there's just a lot of residual mo moisture in the soils, even in sand-based putting greens, and plants are cooking. Um, Second to that is Pythium root rot. Uh, we've started to see that come in pretty heavy. Um, I think people still have a hard time realizing that uh, fungicides in the summer months only last a couple weeks, and so they haven't been uh, maybe as consistent with reapplications as they should have. And then a little bit of summer patch on creeping bent grass, uh, which we see that as a, as a big problem in the transition zone. And then nematodes have also seemed to be an issue this year. Outside of that, uh, you know, it, it seems to me, uh, back to giving a shout out to Lee Miller, it seems like the Midwestern U.S. we've gotten a lot of samples from Indiana, Kentucky, even maybe in the Cincinnati area, out towards Missouri, Arkansas. It seems like that's been, I think, the toughest part of the country this year. Uh, because of, I think, massive amounts of rainfall followed by heat. Yeah, I, I saw, um, uh, Tom, I know that you do some work up at Medina, and I texted um, Curtis yesterday because I saw somebody posted in the area, I think at Glencoe, they got like four and a half inches of rain in like a day or a day and a half and flooded the course out and texted uh, Curtis and said, did you get dumped on? And he said, no, they got like an inch or an inch and a half, and they were holding up pretty well. So I think it's highly variable. Um, yeah. Tom, maybe you want to talk about what we're seeing on the East Coast um, in terms of how dry it's been. Well, it's been drier than I've seen it. I'll start with that. <laughs> um, you know... It, and that's it, a long time, Jim. He's... <laughs> 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 you get into that uh, scenario where you know you're seeing grass go dormant, you've seen it brown, and you and all that. And but then the 
the subject becomes how long can it stay dormant without, you know, just succumbing and going away. And of course, all the landscapers around here who depend on mowing are taking a real beating uh, because nobody's mowing, nobody's even edging sidewalks. So what they're all gearing up to do now is renovate <laughs> because they are looking at all this grass and saying, oh, no, 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 don't bring any rain, just let it croak. <laughs> <laughs> These big companies are probably salivating at the uh, sales that they're going to have this year. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, I, I always go by the crunch test, and, and that is when you really start to not footprint necessarily, it's past the footprint stage, but when you can actually feel it under a soft sh uh, sole shoe and a um, sound, actually, and you hear this, this crunching, then uh, dormancy is just about on its course. These plants are respirated with no carbs left. And so there's, there's going to be turf loss. There's no question about that. How much is anybody's guess? Because these uh, thunderstorms have been highly, highly isolated um, within 50 miles of State College in any direction. Uh, the grass isn't even dormant. It's green and it's like no problem. But in this local area in the valley here, uh, and, you know, it's interesting, it happens the same way in the winter. Sometimes we'll sit here and not get any snow, and it snows all around us. Um, so that pattern sometimes redevelops or maintains itself all summer long, and, and this is one of those summers. So, yeah, for us, um, you know, for, at our research plots, I walked the plots this morning. I was in Canada all last week, and they've been really dry up in Toronto. Um, but they all look good. You know, they all have irrigation. As long as their irrigation systems are uh, running, they can they can keep up with it. Although, you know, they still seem to be thinking that they're struggling. But, you know, I walked four golf courses, and they're, they're in pretty good shape. Um, for us, things like brown patch are, you know, blowing up for us, which is we can get it, and we usually encourage it, but it seems to be coming in on its own. Um, it's so hot, the dollar spot's kind of non-existent for us, except in our roughs. We get, we're blowing up on our roughs. Um, but our putting greens, we're, I don't know why, we're not getting much. Um, our fairways are a little bit. Um, anthracnose is going pretty strong for us. Um, so, you know, the, the typical diseases that we're seeing. I think dollar spot, if you get around Philadelphia, Maryland, um, and along the East Coast, they're seeing a lot more of it than we have. But they're also probably irrigating a lot more than we are um, and have different, you know, expectations and um, thresholds. So, I don't know, like, Jim, I think you're right. Like, I don't know if we're seeing a ton more disease, but the struggle is real. I think a lot of guys are stuck on the end of a hose for sure um, and trying to, to manage the turf. So um, one of the things that you said that you've been seeing and that you know I know you've been working on and I wanted you to talk about specifically was uh, the root rot trials that you have going on right now. And maybe start with um, the beginning, you know, from the standpoint of what you guys found as a grad student and, and how you've transitioned that to what you're seeing now. Yeah, so... Um, you know, when I worked for Lane, we worked on a disease called Pythium root dysfunction. Uh, and at the time, let's see, what was that? Uh, early 2000s, uh, there was a lot of new construction throughout the U.S., a lot of new sand base constructed, and you started seeing these distinct patches. Basically, it looked a lot like take-all patch. And associated with those patches was a pathogen called Pythium volute. And basically the organism, we still don't know why, but depletes root hairs, um, makes a very bulbous root tip. You don't see it really black or, or rotted per se, um, but that's essentially what you see. And it's essentially the plants having trouble taking up water uh, and nutrients during the summer months. And that was a really hot disease, as m both of you probably know. I mean, a lot of people were talking about uh, a pet peeve of mine. They say, well, I had volutum, <laughs> uh, rather than the actual disease of root dysfunction. And uh, basically, I think we've transitioned 
away from that because those greens now are 8, 10, 12, 14, 15 years old in many cases. Um, organic Organics have built up in the root system and we see a different disease called pythium root rot. Uh, and I know it's confusing that I still hear people say, well, I sprayed for root dysfunction or I sprayed for volutum, which tends to be applications in the fall and spring and not so much during the summer. Um, and yet root rot is totally different, where we tend to see it in the Carolinas. Usually our first sample is around the 10th of June, almost every year it seems like somewhere right around the 10th to 15th of June, and it continues, you know, even into now. Uh, and by about August 15th, we tend to see it get better, you know, when uh, those uh, day lengths really start to, to shorten up a little bit. Um, so basically, we've kind of left root dysfunction behind because we don't see it all that often. We usually... Each year we'll make four or five diagnoses. It's typically a, a new construction. Sometimes we see it on old greens. Uh, actually, I diagnosed one that was, I think it was built in 96, and that kind of throws people for a loop. But actually the superintendent, I thought, was doing a really good job of sand top dressing, airification. Basically, you know, kept the greens pretty new, um, and we saw root dysfunction show back up. So where we are with root rot is uh, I had a student who finished this spring uh, where we tried to look at single active ingredients, so things like Segway, Banol, Terrazol, Stellar. What was remarkable, uh, looking at 21-day intervals, so we extended it beyond what any golf course superintendent would do to try to understand differences. It is really and truly the only acceptable control we got with root rot was with Segway. Um, and in particular, what was very interesting with his trials is as we started to get to now, July and August, we only saw acceptable control with Segway mixed with the QOI. It didn't matter which one. The three we had in the study were uh, Fame, which used to be Disarm, Heritage, and Insignia. And I, I like that mixture because you get a lot of diseases this time of year. You know, summer patch, uh, you're going to get excellent brown patch control. If you're one of the fortunate few that don't have QI, QOI and resistant anthracnose, uh, you'll have that as well. And so, again, that was for a thesis, so that I'm hoping to get that trial work published here in the next few weeks. Um, where we also looked at curative control, and what was fascinating with it is Segway at 0.55 fluid ounces, very low rate. The lowest rate on the label is 0.45, was phenomenal for even curative control. Uh, better than Terrazol, better than Subdue, better than Banol, better than Stellar. Um, each one of those products actually provide some control, but what happens is you see the disease start to come down and then about literally five to seven days later they ramp back up, whereas Segway seems to hold that disease in control a little bit better curatively. So I still stick with our um, recommendation. What I typically tell people is Terrazol, watered in eighth of an inch, and then three to five days later followed up with Segway. That's if you're caught with the disease. Now as far as preventative control, this is where maybe some people have trouble. Um, we have a trial out right now that actually looks really, really good where we started at different rates of Segway. And so the one that's really looking phenomenal right now uh, and it's a pretty involved program as we started with Segway at uh, uh, 0.9 ounces, uh, fluid ounces, on May 12th. And then the next application, two weeks later, was Subdue Max. Uh, the next application was Banol. The next application was Signature Extra, all watered in. 
And right now, at least when I looked at them Friday, uh, that still looked almost flawless. Um, and, and as I told you, Mike Soika is hitting me to say, are we going to stop this because our controls uh, are almost dirt uh, right now in that trial. So uh, we have some really nice things going um, with these preventative programs, but the key I think that a lot of people are missing is they think those applications that they might have made for root dysfunction back in March or April, they have no effect on root rot uh, when it starts. You know, looking at that timing is about, for us, we're about a 60 to 65 degree soil temp about the, you know, 10th, 12th of May. So that's what I've been suggesting to people is that you guys would know better if, as you move towards D.C. and Philadelphia, maybe second, third week of May before they get to those kind of soil temperatures depending on the year. The key thing that I suggest to people is that program has to start with Segway. Um, that has been by far the best chemistry, and then you rotate into subdue, ban all, and signature, Watered In is a phenomenal root rot product. was something we found uh, last year. Uh, we just decided to water it in to see what happened, and it worked really, really well. So is that kind of explaining it, John? Or? Yeah, that, that's, yeah that's, that's what I was going to say. Is, um, so if a superintendent's listening or somebody wants to say, okay, there's a lot of process there, um, what, what is your... You know, three, your 30-second preventive suggestion and your 30-second curative suggestion. I know you said it in there, but... 30-second yeah. preventative, uh, basically I think of uh, the 3S program is what I think of. Segway, Signature, Subdue, and then you can also throw in Van all on a two-week interval during the summer months starting at about a 60-degree soil temperature. That's a rotation, or that's you, you, you just start with that and then just keep going through as a program? Yeah, like a rotation. So segue first, subdue, signature, uh, and then either back to segue or ban all, depending on the pressure that uh, they're facing. Curative, uh, the curative has remained the same. I think it's terazol uh, at a three fluid ounce rate, watered in, followed up three to five days later with. Segue. All right, I was on mute. I was I was trying to type some stuff here for uh, this, but um, that's a, I think that's an easier thing to kind of consolidate for them to be able to see. And um, what I'll do is I'll go back and watch this, and I'll put it in the notes. So I'll you know kind of repeat what you said, put the timelines right. so hear you say it. But um, so pythium root. I can, uh, if will it help, John? I've got a. It's basically our little field day write up. I can send you that if they wanted to post that. That shows awesome. programs. Yeah, that would be better. Um, I can actually link to it. Even if you had it on your site or if you just have it as a PDF, I can post it up there um, or a link to it. That will help a lot. Yeah. So the frustrating I feel um, and that it's real and the difference between pythium root dysfunction and pythium root rot, I know a lot of people, even in the north, um, you know, up in New England, everybody all of a sudden started saying they had pythium volutum, which I think there's like maybe one course in New York that had it on one green. Right. You know, and I'm friends with them. That's the only reason I know that. Um, uh, so moving past pythium root rot and pythium root dysfunction, another hot topic uh, that you're seeing and that we're hearing about a lot as well is nematodes. And you mentioned right. uh, indemnify, and uh, I wanted to have you talk a little bit about that and what that means for superintendents. Yeah, so as you mentioned, it, uh, it's funny, I think, you saw that Rick Latin had a uh, post on root not nematode, and I think shortly after that we talked on the phone, and he said, "I'm," um, he said he was very glad he was towards the end of his career because he sees these nematodes, I think, being a big problem. Um, however, you know, with uh, I, I should say before you go forward, any of you that have Nemicure, remember by October. 6th of 2017, uh, you have to use that particular product. After that date, it becomes hazardous waste, and it's going to be expensive for your club to get rid of it. So I'd suggest go ahead and using, for those of you who have stashes of Nemicure, 
because sometime in August, Bayer has a product coming to market called Indemnify, uh, which is a very interesting product because it's actually a fungicide. The active ingredient is called fluopyrin, which uh, is an SDHI fungicide. It's related to things like exemplar or ballista. And for reasons unknown, it's had phenomenal activity on nematodes. Um, it's not quite the same as something like a Nemicure, but it's the only product that at least I've worked with that we see dramatic reductions in nematode counts. Uh, at least the two that we have seen has been sting nematode, which you won't deal with up in the northeast, uh, thankfully, because that little bugger doesn't like cold weather. Uh, and it seems to be effective on root knot nematode, uh, which tends to be a major problem, I think, as you get up into your uh, neck of the woods. Uh, it looks like we're going to get uh, two or three applications uh, with the product. You know, it's going to have uh, a certain amount you can apply. Uh, the big question for us, because from here south, nematodes are a major, major issue, major limiting factor for not only cool season, but ultra dwarf Bermuda grass putty greens is the cost. And we don't know what the cost is going to be. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be cheap. Uh, but it's been very, very effective to where even a single application, you'll see anywhere, at least the data from my own trials and I've seen from Bruce Martin uh, and Billy Crow, it could be a 20 to 70% reduction in nematode counts. Um, the key thing with that product uh, if superintendents start to adopt it is you're going to really have to water it in. It's going to have to be an eighth and I would say maybe even a quarter of an inch of irrigation to see the biggest effect, especially on bent grass because bent grass has pretty deep rooting, you know, compared to annual bluegrass or the ultra dwarf Bermuda grasses. So um, I think that's one of the key things with that product, but it is, you know, it, it is, it's going to, really change how we manage nematodes. It's going to give us a tool that we haven't had uh, in quite some time. So I don't know if you want me to keep going on that, John, or what, what else we want to talk about. Um, no, I think it's good. I, I think that the, you know, it's a fungicide, but with the way that it's going to be applied for nematodes, it's not going to really behave as a fungicide in a lot of cases. Um, in other words, you're not going to get both out of that, both control, I suppose. Yeah, and I think that still you know, remains to be seen because what's interesting, at least that I see, most courses that struggle with root diseases, so like a root rot, summer patch, take-all patch, you tend to also find a pretty substantial nematode population. Uh, some of the characteristics are different. It's formulated specifically to move that active ingredient through the soil and whether or not the roots still take it up as well I, I think remains to be seen but I think they're going to get some benefit as far as soil borne fungi go um, but the main benefit is going to be they're going to see very very nice reductions in their nematode populations. Yeah that's I mean I don't know, around here, we have people that complain about nematodes a lot and, and think that they have them, whether or not that's true or whether there's underlying issues, I don't know um, in a lot of cases. But having an alternative, I think we had Avid on the market for a while and that got pulled, um, that experimental you know, use, I don't remember what the, the label was from the EPA in terms yeah, of... 24C. Yeah, the 24C. We had that in Pennsylvania because I wrote the letter for it. Um, and then that's off, so this is a nice alternative to have a product that might be available. Um, is it like everything else in New York and California are never going to get it? <laughs> well, uh, that's a good question. Um, I know some of the state registrations have already come in. Uh, you know, I think Bear's biggest target is Florida, right? I mean, that's the main issue uh, as far as nematode management is Florida, but I can't imagine that California and New York wouldn't get it because it's, its toxicological profile is not bad. 
Right. Um, I guess it depends on whether or not they hate the word nematocyte. <laughs> you know, that's all that funny thing that comes up. Uh, I will say with Avid, uh, even though the 24C has been canceled, they have until I think June 1st of next year, they can continue making applications. And then at least I'm told by Syngenta that a new formulation of abamectin will hit the market and there won't be a need for a 24C. It will be labeled as a nematocyte. Uh, and I don't think indemnify is going to limit, eliminate the need in high pressure areas for Avid or what the new product becomes. In your neck of the woods, I think there's a lot of, and we all know that superintendents tend to be some of the most creative people. Um, <laughs> They're going to figure out how to use it and use it well. And, you know, if, if they get it in New York, Pennsylvania, you know, I think you guys will get it. It may be only a single application that might be needed. Yeah, which would be great. I think once they, you know, if they get both of them out, if Avid comes back in whatever form it comes back and then Indemnify comes out, <clears throat> there may be multiple options for them to um, try and manage it under the pressure. Now, Florida, you know, that's a whole other can of worms, and, and they may still struggle but have a little bit of help with it. But um, So your field day is coming up. Actually, uh, NC State and Penn State have a field day on the same day, uh, August 10th. Um, what are going to be the highlights of your field day? What are you, what are you looking at showing the people that are going to show up there? So we're showing a root rot trial. Uh, we're showing a trial on developing a growing degree day model for ultra dwarf Bermuda grass for a new and primo. And let's see. Uh, and can we talk about that a little? I didn't want to like ex cut you off, but how are yeah. you um, a new performing for you? A new seems to be doing quite well. Uh, the regulation is very similar to Primo. Uh, we don't seem to see the bronzing associated with the new that we do with Primo on Bermuda grass. Um, it's still a little bit out right now. It looks like about two good solid weeks of regulation uh, with both products. And so the reason we stepped into this was a lot of the issues we see on Ultra Dwarf Bermuda grass we felt was related to over-regulation. Um, diseases, you know, not recovering, being quite severe, and they really shouldn't be. Um, so we've had, I think, nice results with a new uh, and Primo is providing, you know, very nice suppression as well. So it's, I think more for us is understanding where that bottom of the regulation is. And we're not quite there yet. We just started it uh, about a month ago. Are you doing, do you have any new on uh, cool season grasses down south? Uh, we've done that in the past. Um, and even mixed with the DMI, it was it turned it a little purple at first. But then it was fine, and actually, by the end of the trial, it looked phenomenal. Yeah. So we struggled with it a little bit up here, um, mainly because of our polo populations. With the repeated applications, it seems like it uh, it can cause some discoloration uh, and some phytotoxicity. But we messed with it a little bit, and then we kind of backed off of it. Um, so I'm curious who who else has done more work on it and stuff. So you're gonna are you showing that? You're gonna show that obviously at your field day. Yes. Yes, we're showing that. Uh, you know, I hope people will come back. I'm sure you will post it out through our website or whatever when it's done. But Bill Kreuzer is going to do all the analysis of the data so we can actually, you know, develop the GDP model like he did for creeping bent grass. Um, let's see. I think uh, Travis Gannon has some really interesting work that they're looking at. Um, what do we do now that we don't have methyl bromide? Uh, so looking at basimid and, and different uh, mixtures of herbicides um, to look at a renovation. Um, Rick Brandenburg's talking about some work they're doing on, I guess it's kind of like a blitz of neonicotinoids on pollinators. Uh, so that's a pretty interesting little topic. And then, of course, the regular grass uh, and cultivars that are working well. Uh, our field day is usually pretty successful. It's more landscape oriented. Um, but last year I think we had 832 people. So yeah, it's usually a big event. Yeah, that's huge. Got to be one of the bigger ones. 
Um, we're pretty much landscape too. Our we're you know three hours from Pittsburgh and three hours from Philadelphia, so it's tough for golf course superintendents to get away. On, uh, you know noon or 11 o'clock on a day and, and drive up. But um, yeah, very similar though. Ours is kind of turf and ornamental. Um, I guess we should mention what we're going to be showing. Jeff Berger is going to be talking a lot about all the weed management stuff that he has. Um, my lab is going to be talking a lot about POA management. POA cure is supposed to hit the market in the spring of next year, and so that's going to be a hot issue for people to hear about. Uh, we've obviously been doing work on it for you know, about six years now, and uh, and we're still hoping it's coming <laughs> coming out. Um, I think they're waiting to hear back from the EPA as to whether or not they finally approve all the information or whether they want more information from uh, Mogu. But so we'll be talking a little about Poacure and uh, all the disease trials: dollar spot anthracnose, dollar spot brown patch, um, and then playability. We're doing a lot of work on looking at um, stress and summer stress as it relates to playability and trying to kind of fine tune that where you don't put any added stress on um, that's not going to give you any additional benefits from a playability standpoint so we'll be talking about that as well um, lots to see at both places and um, so hopefully uh, both groups get a good turnout and uh, and it's a successful day and I hope that it's not for you it probably will be but I'm hoping for us it goes back to like 80 degree day and not a hundred degree day. Um, I remember a few years ago it was just brutal and everybody's just like sitting down and dying in water like pouring it on their head. And I imagine every field day in uh, August is like that for you but normally we don't. I guarantee it'll be the hottest day of the year. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, you ever, do you ever remember a field day and all the field days that you um, were a part of at Penn State where it was actually decent weather or is it always like that here as well? Well that's pretty much always you know, uh, typical of the, the time of the year. Um, but you also have to squeeze field days and there are dates in uh, that are the most convenient for everybody before classes start and trials are showing what they're going to show in terms of maxing out what uh, they were put on the ground for. So you're kind of at the mercy of old mother nature as always. And if we don't have it blazing hot, we have thunderstorms. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, that's a good point, though. I always get complaints. Why don't you have it in September, you know, when it's easier for us? We verified and we can get up there. And I'm like, well, there's nothing to see, for one thing. You know, you might see some things. But um, classes are started. All of us teach a lot. So it gets tough uh, in schedules and stuff. Um, so it is what it is. But... Um, I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to anybody that has any uh, final comments. And uh, Jim, I'll first thank you for coming on. I know you got a lot going on in the field and diagnostic lab, and um, and I'm sure paperwork as all of us do. So uh, thank you first and foremost. And then uh, I know that you mentioned field day. August 10th is your field day. And uh, anything else that you want to talk that's coming up or that you're going to be speaking at or that's going on? Yeah, I guess it's a uh, blur of summer, and I'm getting ready for – my class, so I can't remember my first speaking engagement right now. <laughs> That's all right. We'll link to your website so that if you ever update that or um, put that anywhere, we'll, they can always just keep going back from the YouTube page to, to see it. But um, lots of great information um, from you and really appreciate it. I think the idea of talking not only about what we're seeing out in the field, which is kind of those hot topics, but, you know, trying to decipher and um, distinguish between the pythium, the root pythiums that you've been working with and also giving your kind of 30 second blitz of uh, preventive and curative control. I think it's one of those things that a lot of people can get out of this. I'll go back in the video and I'll make sure I, I tag to that so that people can just skip right to that part um, and not hear me pontificate too much but they'll be able to uh, you know hear and, and see what you have and then if you can provide that link to um, kind of your recommendations that will be helpful as well. Yeah, I'll send you this PDF of the field day uh, guide because they can see these different programs that we put together. Awesome. Tom, you got anything to promote? Anything you got coming on? Uh, uh, not, uh, not a promotion, but a thank you, Jim. That was great to see you and uh, listen to what's going on in NC State. And I uh, wish you well with uh, all your projects, and you'll figure out when classes start. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's always a blur to that. I have to admit that um, running the two-year program and my classes don't start till like September 28th or 9th, whatever that Monday is. Um, 
so not that I'm not busy, but it's awesome to be around here from August 22nd until then when everybody else is like stressed and like everything's going on and I can still wrap up my research from the summer and write some reports and get some things done. So um, it's definitely a, a nice benefit to have. So, um, All right. Right from the cooker on August 17th, my class starts. So fun. <laughs> Uh, well, good luck with that, and uh, I'm sure that it's uh, a good class. I'm sure you enjoy it. I know that it's a lot more work, but uh, it's also uh, rewarding to interact with the students and, and see the new next generation. It's a blast. Yeah. All right, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you again, Tom. Thanks for joining us, and um, and Jim for sharing all the information you did. Good luck on your field day. And uh, Oh, before we go, I need to... Um, I want to quickly say, I think that we have uh, Curtis Tyrell. I mentioned him earlier. I think we have him coming up uh, next. Um, I'm going to get to my third guy. Yeah, Curtis Tyrell is going to be our next guest in about two weeks. looks like August 4th, which is like a Monday or a Tuesday, so I'll give a promotion to him. Curtis is the uh, director of golf at Medina Country Club, hosted the Ryder Cup in 2012. And with the Ryder Cup coming up not too far from him at Hazeltine National, I thought it would be good to have him on um, to discuss things that he's seeing. So he's our next guest. Uh, but again, Jim, thanks a lot, and I appreciate it, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Thanks, Jim.